Hello, and welcome to your video on finding deflections, maximum or the equation of the elastic curve, using superposition and the deflection tables. So we want to start off with this example that we see here of a cantilevered beam that has a uniform distributed load just on the free end, the, the last half of the beam within the free end. And so if we wanted to find this using our integration techniques, we know we'd have to write moment expressions, but because the load is discontinuous, we'd need two cuts to find two moment expressions. And so we would cut from zero to L over two, from the free end to L over two, and then again inside of the uniform load. So that means that integration is gonna take a while. It's gonna take some time and we would love to be efficient. And so why don't we go ahead and see if we can't try to use the actual deflection tables. And so hopefully you have either a textbook in front of you with deflection tables in the appendix. In Beer and Johnston, it's either appendix D if you're in the seventh edition or appendix F if you're in the eighth edition, or maybe you have a handout in front of you with deflection tables. So here would be the deflection table for cantilevered beams. This comes out of Hibbler's textbook. And what we see in here is that there is something that looks similar to what we have, but the loading is in the first half closest to the support where ours is in the second half farthest away from the support. So that's problematic. There is the whole load, uh, the whole beam being loaded, but that's also not helpful to us. So what potentially could we do? Well, there is this idea of something called superposition, and hopefully you learned about superposition in your stacks course. But as long as the beams remain elastic, superposition says that we can separate all of the loads. So if you have a, a moment and a uniform load and a point load, you could actually separate those, analyze the beam, um, and find just reactions. You could find internal shear and moments. You could find stresses, deflections, whatever and then add or superimpose those results back together. At this point, you probably have done, or you should have done, combined loading. And so if you think about when you take apart and you just look at the stress from an axial load, and then you look at the normal stress from a bending moment and you add those together, that's superposition in action. So let's see if there's a way we could add some loads together or subtract but combine some loads together to help us out to solve this particular problem without having to do integration. So to do that, we wanna go back to our beam table. And we can go back to that same first beam that we circled, but let's go ahead and circle the uniform load across the entire length. And let's think about if there was a way we could combine these together. What if instead of adding, we subtracted the beam that just had load in the first half, we subtracted that result from the beam that has the load over the entire length. The other way you could think about it is what if we change the direction of the load on the lower beam, the one with the load only in the first half, what if we change the direction? What if we said the load was going up and then we added that to the beam with the load going down over the entire length? Whichever works for you visually is just fine. And so what we want to do is let's take these two beams and bring them back to our problem. And we'll just write out what those will look like. So I'm just going to redraw it here very quickly. So I'm taking that first beam with the load across the entire length. And from the tables, we got back out that the maximum deflection at the free end would be negative WL to the fourth over 8EI. And then... The second beam that only had the uniform load over the first half, the tables told us at the free end that deflection would be negative WL to the fourth over 384 EI. So if we subtracted the negative 7 WL to the fourth over 384 EI from the first beam, we could potentially then say that our max total would be just the max from the first beam minus the max from the second beam. If we write out our expressions, that we already took from the beam table. And now we can see because we're subtracting a negative value, actually adding that 
superimposing it. And we would get back out a negative 41 WL to the fourth over 384 EI would be our maximum deflection at the free end. And that's quick. That's a heck of a lot faster than integrating. But you as the engineer, you as the solver, have to be savvy enough to say, okay, what loads can I combine and how can I combine them? And we did really still end up adding these together because we had a negative and a negative. All right, so that's one example that we could do. Let's look at a second example. So here we have a second example that says, okay, let's actually find the displacement at five feet from the left side for this simply supported beam that is, oops, I'm gonna go back, sorry. For the simply supported beam that is 20 feet long, has a uniform load across the entire length, four kips per foot, and it has a point load in the center of 35 kips. Now for this particular problem, we happen to know that the beam is a W24 by 68, it's steel, so it's gonna have E equal to 29 times 10 to the six PSI, that's a constant. And then I for the W24 by 68, I along the strong axis, because we'll orient this on the strong axis, would be 1830 inches to the fourth. And again, I don't know about you, but I wanna be efficient, so I'm gonna integrate not going to integrate. I'm not going to integrate. I'm going to use superposition. So let's check out what that would look like. So if we jump now to our beam table for simply supported beams, we see that we have both the case on here with the point load in the middle and we have the case with the uniform load. So that's pretty awesome. And in this case, we don't want to find the max deflection. Um, and on both of these, we can see in that first column there, the max deflection does occur in the middle, it's labeled, but we don't care about the max. We wanna find it at x equal to five, so we need to go to that last column and get the equation of the elastic curve and use that for this problem. So let's go back to our original problem and let's just go back to where we were. So we wanna use superposition and I just now wanna bring those two beams over so we have the distributed load of four kips per lineal foot acting along 20 feet. Again, X is from the left end. And we got from the deflection tables, the equation of the elastic curve. That's that negative WX over 24 EI times the quantity of X cubed minus 2LX squared plus L cubed. And then we want to add to that the simply supported beam with the point load in the middle of 35 kips. And from our deflection tables, we got that the equation of the elastic curve is negative px over 4080i times 3l squared minus 4x squared. And so in this case, when we want to look at our total deflection at 5 feet from the free end, deflection or deformation, we can use those interchangeably, but deflection is always like a sag in a beam, where de deformation is a more common term for any sort of deformation. Um, but we can see we can just add in the deformation at five feet from beam one to the deformation of five feet at beam two. And if we start plugging in values for that, we can look at beam one first. Let's remember we have four kips per foot times five feet is the very first term. So it's nice. Those two feet terms actually cancel each other. And as we plug in five feet and 20 feet, in our bracketed term in the numerator, we'll see that we have a bunch of distance cubed terms. And then in the denominator, we wanna make sure that we pay attention to the units of E. And so E was given as 29 times 10 to the six PSI, but since our loads are in kips, I went ahead and changed that to 29 times 10 to the three KSI. So we can make sure our units are all still good. But now when we look at our units, our kips cancel, that's great, but we're gonna have inches squared on the bottom because our kips per square inch and our inches to the fourth result in an inches squared, and we have length cubed in feet on the top. So we wanna convert that feet cubed on the top to inches. So we're gonna multiply the whole thing by 12 inches per foot quantity cubed. All right, let's finish this up. 
So we can then plug in for our second term. So we have our 35 kips. Now there's nothing to cancel that five feet this time as far as the feet units. So we're still gonna end up with feet cubed on the top. When we look at our expression, we'll put in our E and our I term, keeping our units in kips and inches. And so again, we need to convert um, our feet cubed on top. This time, I happen to know what 12 inches cubed is because you use it a lot in deflection equations. That's one of the things you just sort of remember, like two plus two equals four. So 17, 28 inches cubed is feet cubed. And those two are equivalent terms. And finally, our answer turns out to simply be a zero, negative 0 0.324 inches, or we can rewrite that as 0 0.324 inches going downwards. And the final thing I want to leave you with is please always report this in inches. Because if you try to report this in feet, the equivalent would be 0 0.027 feet downward or negative. And I don't know about you, but that's really hard to visualize. A third of an inch is easier to visualize. It's the same thing as if we were in metric units. If you had 0 0.003 meters of deflection, that's not nearly as easy to envision as just saying three millimeters. And we would report in metrics in a millimeter. All right. I hope this helped you out. Have a great day.